The poet and contemporary of William Shakespeare, John Lilly, in 1578 wrote, The rules of fair play do not apply to love and war, uh, which gave rise to the idiom, all's fair in love and war. It means that anything goes when exigency is demanded. My next story in this series, which is number seven, is called In Love and War, and it covers this predicament. I'm not sure that Harry should have forgiven his friend, Jeff, quite so easily for stealing his girlfriend. But what do you think? Us fair in love and war, right? Those were the words used by Jeff Wilson when he bumped into his friend Harry Peterson in Duke's Wine Bar near Stone Street in Lower Manhattan on a Wednesday lunchtime. Jeff had his hand extended firmly towards his love rival, Harry, whom he had not seen since the vanquishment of the latter some time previously when he had stolen his girlfriend from him. The matter had been known for three weeks by those in their circle of friends, and had finally become known to the unfortunate Mr. Peterson just two weeks before. Harry hesitated, looked at the proffered hand which refused to budge, and met the unflinching gaze of his erstwhile friend unflinchingly, and then broke into an involuntary smile of rueful resignation. Ah, what the hell, he said shaking his head. Life's too short for holding grudges. He accepted the hand, and the two friends shook vigorously on the restoration of their friendship. You got that right, said Jeff, with some satisfaction that his old friend should let bygones go by in favour of an old friendship. We've been friends too long to allow a woman to break up the old team, even a girl like Cindy, said Harry Peterson. It was true enough. The men had been friends since college and roomed together in New York for a couple of years. They still went to games together, enjoyed sailboarding and surfing vacations, and occasionally competed over the same girl. Such things are inevitable when a couple of stags are circling the herd, but it had never caused a rift like this one over Cindy had. Of course, Cindy was no ordinary girl, a glamorous model, she was so good-looking, sometimes she didn't look quite real. Harry had certainly felt that Jeff snatching Cindy from under his nose when he had been out of town for a week was decidedly below the belt. They had not spoken, but messages of candid fury had been relayed by helpful friends of both to the amatory interloper and returned by him with equal vigour and candour. It had seemed to those about them that the friendship was forever ended. It was something of a surprise to both men, therefore, when they crossed paths in Duke's wine bar, by pure chance that lunchtime just two weeks later, and found themselves able to bury the hatchet so easily. Come on, let me buy you a drink, said Jeff. The two men moved in the direction of the bar, following this armistice. Their old camaraderie was soon reaffirmed over a drink, and in a short time, all awkwardness between them had vanished. You know, Cindy is some girl. She knows what she wants, and it wasn't me, said Harry generously, after a second, or perhaps a third drink. Jeff just shrugged in helpless sympathy, and put his hand on his friend's shoulder in sporting commiseration. You know continued Harry in a serious tone. Cindy is one of those women who likes money. Don't they all? laughed his friend. No, I mean really likes it. Has to have it. If you haven't got money, you haven't got Cindy. Well, his friend began, his hands open in helpless acknowledgement of an unpalatable truth about the nature of fine women, but hardly knew how to continue the sentence. He considered it injudicious to point out at this juncture that Cindy simply had an eye for the better man. That would never do. 
He had no desire to pluck out the tender green shoots of renewed friendship so early in their rapprochement. And you know what, said Harry, the thing is, you have more money than I do. Oh, not so much, his victorious friend disclaimed. It sounded vaguely insulting to him. Harry brushed aside the modest denials. Oh, enough, enough, he assured him. Now don't get me wrong here. If, or when, I should say when, someone comes along with more money than you, Cindy will drop you like a bad habit. He took a long, satisfied pull on his drink, one hand in his pocket, head tilted back, Adam's apple rising along the contour of his long throat, and then dropping back down again abruptly. Ha! <sighs> he said. Jeff considered this and that. He'd let him have that one. It would ease the blow to his friend's ego, give him a soft landing. He'd taken the main prize already. Well, I'll try to keep ahead of the game, he said. Don't worry, don't worry, you're safe enough for now. You'll have your work cut out to keep her, though, you know. True, said Jeff, shrugging it away. He was young still, just thirty-one. He had ambition, and he expected to rise in the city. It was all in front of him, the good things in life. And Cindy, too, he thought, with some satisfaction. Damn, they made a good-looking couple, too. He with his straight black hair, keen jaw, white teeth and tan, and athletic slim frame, wearing a crisp white shirt beneath his dark grey tailored suit to perfection. And she? Well, wearing just about anything, but always expensive, new, ticketed like a signpost, could see her coming a mile off, blonde, an impossible figure that turned the heads of wistful older men and hopeful young ones, and those of women who'd like to scratch her eyes out. It was too bad that his best friend, Harry, had been seeing Cindy first, but she and Jeff had just hit it off spectacularly, and she was Jeff's sort of woman, and as Harry himself acknowledged, Cindy was a hard-to-keep sort of girl. She liked attention and flowers and expensive jewellery, looked first at your eyes and then at your hands second to see what was in them when you arrived at her apartment door. You were lucky to have her, and she knew you knew it by the toss of her golden head. She didn't give herself away for nothing. And anyhow, all is fair in love and war. It was good that Harry saw things the same way as he did. I'm just glad you and me are okay, he said, with some sincerity and affection. We are, old buddy, said Harry, thumping his friend in the chest. And you and Cindy will be too, at least until some oligarch or sheik comes along. They laughed, and Harry got them another drink. It was crowded in the bar that lunchtime, but they managed to get a table. The demands of old friendship competed successfully with, triumphed over the demands of work that day, and after the two had had a few drinks, well, to hell with work. They talked of things, the big game, mutual acquaintances, of work, inevitably, and left Cindy tacitly to one side, and money, especially their respective remuneration, a little competitive here, naturally, with an added edge to it born of recent events, but neither pushed the matter of their six-figure salaries further than a few chest bumps allowed. It was just two young stags locking horns after the battle had already been settled. Of course, Jeff withdrew from the entanglement first. He was, after all, the undisputed victor here. His preeminence was assured. There was an unspoken truth between them. He was the monarch of the glen. Funny thing, money, isn't it? Said Jeff, returning from the restroom. Pity it wasn't easier to make. Harry drank to that, perhaps a little hesitantly. Well, he said, after a little pause, which Jeff caught with a sudden quick look at his friend. There are ways, of course, 
certain ways of making a lot of money, easily too, but you can't do it. It's too risky. Ah, I don't mean holding up a bank or tunneling into Fort Knox, laughed Jeff. Nor do I, Harry assured him. But the big bucks come with risks. Jeff's eyes were shining. He was already a winner. Risk was a game he enjoyed and knew how to play. He studied his friend closely. I knew you were onto something, he said quietly. You are, aren't you? No, Harry shook his head unconvincingly. Okay, tell me, Jeff demanded at last. Tell you what? There's nothing to tell, Harry said without looking at his old friend. There is, Jeff affirmed, watching him still. Okay, it's illegal and it's dangerous too, said Harry. Is that why you haven't tried it? inquired Jeff, playfully needling him. Harry was serious now. He nodded and spread his hands out in supplication before him. He was accepting defeat at every level. I can't, he said. For me, it's impossible. And for me? inquired Jeff, taking a careful sip of his drink, but maintaining his gaze on Harry above the rim of his glass. For you? Harry considered. Not impossible, just plain dumb, he said. Tell me, there was a glint in Jeff's eye still. The better man had won. No, forget it. It is, like I said, dumb and risky as hell. I'm a risk taker, returned Jeff. That you are, agreed his friend ruefully. And you're plenty dumb too, but not that dumb. Forget it. He returned to his drink, and a thoughtful silence ensued. At last, Jeff said, You know something, don't you? And I want to know what it is. Harry looked at him, and smiled, and waved this away. No, I mean it. Let's change the subject. Are you going to Burning Man this year? No, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. You? I'll be in London next year, Harry reminded him. So it'll probably be Stonehenge in the rain or something like that. Yes, bring your brolly, Jeff nodded, grinning. I'd forgotten that, he said. When'd you go? Next weekend, after this one. I'm just sorting out the apartment and, well, I won't be sorry to say goodbye to this place for a while. Jeff was elsewhere. He was distracted. I wish you'd tell me what it is you know, old buddy he said. If I could, I would, said Harry, placing a firm, reassuring hand of regretful friendship on his shoulder. But I can't. They let the matter drop and drank up. The bar had got noisier. It was not conducive to conspiracy. They parted a little after four that afternoon. For the rest of the day, Jeff had a gnawing feeling that Harry was holding out on him over something big. It niggled him. He obviously knew something, some business thing, and it involved money. But what? His mind ran rampant with possibilities, but it took him nowhere he wanted to go. The notion of easy money, certain money, seemed to him to be within his grasp in some vague, intangible way, just a feeling. And yet his friend, his oldest friend, held the key to this. After all, what was risky to Harry was not necessarily risky to Jeff. Jeff would take a sail out on a wave when the flag was red. He walked on the grass when there was a sign saying, keep off the grass. He parked in disabled parking spots when there were no other places, and then limped away from his car, clutching his leg to reassure the elderly couple who surveyed his expensive car and suit suspiciously. He was a man accustomed to getting his way in life. Harry was undoubtedly holding out on him. Of course, it might be that he thought Jeff had won enough already. The next day was Thursday. Mid-afternoon, Jeff called Harry up and arranged to meet him for a drink after work. 
They met at the same place, Dukes. The trading floors had closed, with securities rising again, leading to hopes of a bull market. It was really jam-packed now, no chance of a table, and not a place for eliciting deep confidences. But in spite of this, Jeff managed to find a quiet place where they could talk, and Harry quickly saw why his friend had wanted to meet him. He was prepared to press him hard. Jeff had a way of not taking no for an answer. That is probably what had lured Cindy away, he thought. Harry just shook his head at his friend's imprecations to divulge his secret. Not a chance, he said pleasantly, and quite infuriatingly. He told Jeff that he was not going to tell him for his own good. Hey, I'm your buddy, right? countered Jeff. Of course, true blue, Harry confirmed. Then tell me. Listen, it's because you're my buddy that I won't tell you, he laughed. Ah, don't give me that, Jeff exclaimed. Since when have we kept secrets from each other? You have to ask me that, Harry grinned with sly reproach. Really? That aside, Jeff said quickly, that's different. You're the best friend I have, he insisted. Listen, when I say this is risky, what I really mean is dangerous. Prison dangerous, Harry told him. Well then, why would I do it? It's not like I'd rob a bank or something, is it? You can tell me. Harry thought long and hard and appraised his friend, then shook his head, now very sober. Well, I will tell you, he said, but I'm not going to give you the information you will need to act on it, okay? Understood. The how, but not the what. Exactly. There is a company, let's say a group, said Harry, choosing his words carefully, up edging a beer mat and toying with it as he thought. This company or group is about to be taken over by a corporation. It's a huge deal, and it's tied in to an oil-rich state. This thing is the biggest you could imagine. That big, huh? Think that big, and then go bigger, said Harry. When this goes public, the value of the shares will go through the roof. Jeff said, we are talking big, aren't we? Oh, yes. The shares could go to, what, 20, 30 times their value? Oh, easily. The shares could go to 50, maybe 60 times up in value. More. We are talking... Oh, man, he shook his head in disbelief. We're talking record-breaking rises here. Jeff's eyes were gleaming with cunning avarice, like they were the first time Harry had introduced him to Cindy, noted the latter, a momentary tinge of resentment rekindling. Have you got shares in this company? Jeff asked quietly. Are you nuts? It's insider trading. I've signed all sorts of non-disclosure documents on this. The SEC are watching everyone, monitoring what we have for lunch. I can't go to the restroom without registering it with them. If I told you the name of the company even, I could be serving ten years, minimum. I get it, Jeff nodded. It's just a fun thought. The two men sat in silence for a time. The bar was raucous with laughter. It was after ten now. The trading floor in New York had long closed. London was now in silence. Tokyo was still beyond the equator of tomorrow's rising sun. It's a pity, though, eh? said Jeff at last, wistfully. Oh, yes, Harry agreed. I suppose there are people who have shares who have no idea about the windfall they're about to get, Jeff mused. Listen, there are people like me and you who are grifting in offices today, doing okay, but are going to wake up with tens of millions of dollars a week Monday. And they don't know it. What a wasted opportunity, said Jeff, with heartfelt regret. A further silence ensued. I suppose you couldn't get someone to buy the shares for you, he suggested innocently. I mean... 
someone unconnected who you could split the profits with afterwards. You have got to be kidding me. All trading in the shares of these companies is being watched for anything amiss. Any sudden movement of money into my bank account and the SEC had have me behind bars like that. He snapped his fingers emphatically in demonstration of the simplicity and absoluteness of the transformation such errant behaviour would bring to his personal fortunes and to his liberty. I suppose, Jeff assented ruefully. Now, there is only one thing that is certain here, said Harry, and that is that I can't benefit by a single cent from this deal. Jeff sighed. So near and so far, he said. Yep, you said it. A girl on a stool at the bar had caught Jeff's eye. He sensed her interest. Nothing obvious, just the way she tossed her head when she saw him looking in her direction. He was good at knowing the signals and sending them too. It was just small things, the way she handled her glass with her long red-nailed fingers and crossed her legs with perfect insinuation. She was wearing a ring. Of course, that meant nothing. She was brunette, the opposite of Cindy. A rich man could have her and Cindy. They lived by different rules. Hmm. He looked back at Harry squarely. You could tell me, he said. No, I couldn't, Harry said firmly. You could if you wanted, Jeff said with a soft, persuasive voice. Harry wondered if this was the sort of voice he had used with such caressing effect on Cindy while he was away. You're insane, he said, turning away. Not so much. Think about it. I'd rather not, said Harry. How often does a chance like this come up? You're not thinking straight. Cindy is infecting your brain. She can do that. Jeff waved this aside. No, this isn't about Cindy. He was deadly serious now. Just think of it. I'm not connected to your work. Who could trace it if I suddenly bought a lot of shares? They would, the SEC. You know me and I know you. That's nothing. Even if they trace the link between us, how could it ever be proved? They'd say we had an arrangement. They know their business. How? Where's your half? And remember, I stole your girlfriend. Why would you, of all people, do me a favour? Hmm, it's a fair point, his friend said, with a sudden mock-annoyed look at Jeff. Why would I? Because you could, you know, and no one would ever guess. Jeff could see he was turning his friend. He always could get round him. He could see that Harry was turning it over in his careful mind, in spite of himself. Harry now had a gleam in his eye too, just a cautious one, but it was there like a low flame. He was thinking. I'd say he's no friend of mine, Harry said at last. He stole my girl. Everyone knows it. I hope you jail him and he rots. Exactly, said Jeff. Do you see? It's perfect. But listen, said Harry. Reality check here. It is a risk. And how do I benefit from it exactly? You've had enough from me already. Well, look, you don't benefit for a while, obviously. Ah, let's say never then, shall we? Give it three years, suggested Jeff. Three years. It's not that long to wait for this kind of prize. We could pool our resources if we don't overcook it. We could get maybe 50 or 70 million if we could get a million dollars together for shares. I reckon we could. Harry looked tempted. He had a faraway look in his eyes, but then snapped away and said with finality, No, it would never be safe, and it isn't worth the risk. It's nuts. The two men sat moody, 
The early drinkers had left. The bar had thinned out. The girl at the bar had left too. A last glance in Jeff's direction, which he caught unerringly, and held her gaze a little too long in consequence. It left a subdued feeling in the place, the odd raucous laughter persisting still from the corner, and a shrill feminine reply accentuating this. I suppose you'll be in London on Monday, ventured Jeff. A week Monday, yes, but don't get any ideas. The SEC has a long reach, so don't even think about it. I suppose not. But you could leave the name of the company somewhere for an old friend. He smiled. <laughs> Listen, I can never make anything from this deal. Never. That's final. But I guess you could, if you don't go over the top. After all, you're going to need it with Cindy. But you need to temper your ambition. You need to go in for maybe a hundred thousand tops. Forget about fifty or seventy million. That'll get you caught. Uh, that way you stand to make maybe five million with a bit of luck. That's not bad. You could manage it. But listen, if I tell you the name of the companies, we can never speak again. Not for years. If there are inquiries, you play it dumb all the way to the bank. I'll deny it. We haven't spoken for ages. We fell out. Cindy, remember? Maybe if we meet in a few years' time, you can do me a favour. Let me have a million, perhaps. But I don't expect it. That's up to you. Jeff nodded vigorously. You're the best friend I ever had, he said. Harry looked at him thoughtfully. Yes, I am, you know, he said. The two men clapped each other about the shoulders. They left the bar together and walked to the corner of Broad Street. Here they paused. The autumn air was chilled. Jeff shivered, but it wasn't from the cold. There was a thrill of excitement knotted up in his stomach. Harry looked at his friend, a last moment of caution on the verge of a great enterprise. Now listen carefully, said Harry. I'm not writing any of this down, and nor should you. I will tell you the names, and you remember them. Call your broker. Put a bet on them. But for God's sakes, don't put your shirt on it. Be judicious. The bigger you are in it, the more suspicious it'll look. Don't get too greedy. And you can't contact me again. Not for years. You can rely on me, buddy, said Jeff. Don't blow it. This is my wedding present to you and Cindy, goddammit. Said Harry. He leaned forward and spoke to his friend in a whisper. The corporation is Schwinn, he began. He spoke for no more than a minute, there outside Broadstones at the corner of Broad Street and Stone Street. Traffic and voices came and went, oblivious in the night. Jeff listened, his mind working furiously, and gave a low conspiratorial whistle. You got that? Jeff nodded, deep in thought. The two men embraced one last time and parted. Saturday night, Harry was packed for London. His night was restless. He thought of Cindy and at last resigned himself to her loss. She was in the past. Even if he'd had the choice, he couldn't go back. He realised that now. Such betrayal is beyond repair. He thought of his friend, Jeff, too. He'd miss him. There'd been some good times. Much of their friendship had been based on a sort of rivalry, as he thought about it now. It had always been that way. And he had to admit it. Jeff had always edged him out. He thought he had put one over on him when he and Cindy had hooked up. But, well, no. It was plain Jeff had won this round, too. There are winners and there are losers in every game, Harry thought wryly. He had no regrets, and anyway, what would be the point? In the morning he would fly to London. He'd be gone for a couple of years at the very least, more likely five. Would he see Jeff and Cindy again? It seemed unlikely. He finally slept, recalling a day one summer, years ago, when he and Jeff were sailing on Lake Erie and got into trouble. 
The two had ended up in the water. He couldn't swim, and Jeff, who was a strong swimmer, had hauled off for shore, ignoring his cries for help. He had somehow made it to a large rock near the shore. The incident had nearly cost Harry his life then. The two had rowed about it afterwards, Harry accusing his friend of leaving him to drown. Well, I had to look out for number one, he had said, jokingly. And then, with a winning grin, you know I'd have come back for you, buddy. It made Harry smile to think of this now. It had been a near thing, though. Perhaps it had portended the future. Jeff, number one. Yes, perhaps. In the morning, Harry woke. He made himself a coffee and drank about half of it and called a taxi. He took a look around the apartment. He'd miss the place. He'd miss New York. He'd had a lot of good times here. But the memories had begun to hang about it too heavily for him. He needed a clean break. He stopped and put the keys of the apartment in an envelope near the door for the building super. He sorted through some last-minute papers. Passport, tickets, wallet, pounds, cash. He sat down at the small table in the sitting room, drawing a piece of paper towards him. His pen was poised, brief, in contemplation above it. And then he bore down with it, sudden with inspiration, and wrote a few words, and then folded it and placed it in a priority mail express envelope and sealed it. The taxi arrived, and in a few moments his luggage was in the trunk, and he sat back in the rear of the taxi, watching the tall buildings of the city pass by. Yes, he'd miss all this. Oh, wait, driver. I nearly forgot. Stop by a mailbox, he told the man behind the wheel. Well, there isn't a lot of time for your flight. It's important, he said, this time. The cabby pulled over obligingly, and he got out, paused before the blue mailbox, and then inserted the letter into the slot and let it fall irrevocably into the box. The following day, across town, Jeff was up early. He hadn't slept much either. He was waiting for the trading floors to open for business. He had almost a million dollars riding on Schwinn Corporation Electronics Communications Hardware. All he could manage to raise, beg, steal and borrow at such short notice, throw on caution to the winds, he'd rifle Cindy's modelling money too, emptied her account without telling her. But she was going to thank him like hell for this deception later today when he told her. Oh yes. This million dollars buy-in would net him, with luck, 50, maybe 70 million dollars by lunchtime on Wall Street. They'd shop for a mansion at the weekend, he and Cindy, a yacht on Lake Erie, a summer house there too, with a jetty, perhaps. He wondered if Cindy would like Paris. They must do Europe. He had his laptop open on the low coffee table before the sofa. His phone was buzzing next to it. Sometimes he glanced at his phone and stabbed the screen pad in response to some query. Mostly he just watched. The news was starting to hit the financial desks now. He could hear Cindy in the bathroom. She called to him. Can you get me a coffee, honey? Sure. Give me a minute. I have a surprise for you. Oh? She appeared at the door to the bathroom in a towel, sensing excitement. What is it? Tell you later, he grinned. She bit her underlip in excited anticipation. You've been secretive all weekend, she accused him, delighted, winding her dark and wet blonde hair around her index finger coyly. What's going on, Jeff? He winked expressively and grinned, but said nothing. She pouted playfully in response and withdrew to the bathroom in excited anticipation, her mind cartwheeling with random but expensive speculations. It was that Cartier watch she mentioned to him on Saturday. Definitely. 
Jeff sat on the edge of the sofa as the digits on the clock finally flipped to 9.30. It had been a long time coming. Trading opened with a roar as billions of dollars swung into action. All the enterprise and wealth of America and far beyond flung out around the globe like a lighted wand upon the world. News coming through. Update. Wall Street. Then, Schwinn goes into liquidation. Receivership. Receivers. PricewaterhouseCoopers. Discovery of fraud. Under investigation. Saudi not involved, says State Department spokesperson. It was all a blur. He had to keep reading the words over and over to comprehend their meaning. They were just words, words and tumbling figures. He typed furiously at the laptop, switching between sites, news outlets, financial gurus. Time passed. Comprehension came slowly. Billions wiped from the trading floors as markets opened this morning, he heard. Panic in the city, proclaimed CNN. No win for Schwinn was trending on X, formerly known as Twitter. The doorbell was ringing somewhere which seemed far off. It might be in his head. He stumbled to the door. The postman was there with a the special delivery. Jeff signed for it in a limp daze and looked again at his laptop, the lines turning red, a sea of miserable red. He tore open the letter quickly. There was just one line on the folded piece of paper. It read, In love and war, old boy, in love and war. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.